Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Australian Lebanese Chamber of Commerce Networking Lunch. Um, thank you for your attendance today. The Chamber would like to acknowledge and support the ALCC's partners, Arab Bank Australia, and uh, its uh, many supporters, including Etihad Airways, our diamond sponsor, Tradelink, our platinum sponsors, Commonwealth Bank, AGL Energy Connections, Dakin, JJ Metro Air Conditioning, and the many gold and silver sponsors that make up the chamber. I'd also like to thank those that are attending today and taking their time out of your busy schedules to attend. To launch formalities today, I'd like to call on the President of the Australian Lebanese Chamber of Commerce, Mr. Joe Qatar AM. Thank you, Peter. Good afternoon and welcome. On behalf of the Australian Lebanese Chamber of Commerce Board of Directors, I would like to offer a warm welcome to each and every one of you here today. It's wonderful to see a large presence of such beautiful ladies, not many this time, huh? A wonderful to see a large presence of such wonderful ladies. Thank you for joining us here today to celebrate the fourth annual ILCC Ladies Lunches. I would like to acknowledge our partner, the Arab Bank Australia, and thanks our gold and silver sponsors. I would like to thank the local Lebanese Middle Eastern media for their ongoing support who have all the help made this event possible. We as a chamber, our we are proud of our ongoing great relationship with our members and friends, and are always working to enhance the relationship with events such as today's luncheon. The chamber is, always, is also known to be supportive of an extremely grateful for the inevitable contribution of women across diverse profession in the community. These positive contribution are all critical to what we are trying to achieve in our organizations and are highly valued and recognized. For this reason, I always look forward for the networking luncheon and have been delighted to watch them growing over the last few years. On behalf of the ALCC board members, I would like to thank Nadia Obeid, our executive secretary for all her hard work putting this wonderful event together, working closely with and assisted by, Nadia, uh, by Tanya Druby. Our thanks also go to the Dalton House who always do a fantastic job, and we are very proud of the long relationship we have with Paul Senor Ali and his entire team. Once again, we are most, you are most welcome, and I have no doubt that you will thoroughly enjoy today's presentation by our dear friends, Dr. Shane Giha, who will be speaking on density and how the city of Sydney can best accommodate for population growth, which is, I am sure you will all agree, and subject to, uh, a subject of interest to us all. Please enjoy the event and thank you. Thank you, Joe, for your kind welcome. Ladies and gentlemen, just to tell you about today's event, um, we're going to probably just take a bit of a break and give you the opportunity to network and talk with each other. Um, and then I'm going to invite our guest speaker, Dr. Shane Giha, to the stage. So if for now, please enjoy your meal and uh, we'll come back to you pretty soon. Thank you.
Shane was the founding managing director of EG Property Urban Planning and is one of the leading rezoning experts in New South Wales. Shane has extensive rezoning experience and brings a combination of practical know-how and value creation skills to projects he's involved in. Shane's worked on projects and increased land value after rezoning land at Little Bay, Riverston, Tempe and Wonderland, New South Wales, to name a few. His focus is working closely with clients on property uplift strategies and implementation. Shane completed his PhD in planning on quantifying the rezoning effect at the University of New South Wales in 2013. He lectures part-time at the University of Sydney in a number of engineering courses as adjunct assistant professor. Shane also recently appointed adjunct professor of the School of Civil Engineering at the University of New South Wales. Shane co-founded EG in 1999 together with Dr. Michael Eason AM. EG was the first private company in New South Wales to work exclusively in the rezoning sphere, rezoning land for external clients. By 2000, Shane and brother Adam with Michael Eason founded EG Funds Management. Since then, EG Group has earned a high reputation in both property and land rezoning and funds management. EG Property has rezoned $19 billion in land in the past 20 years and constructed $280 million in projects to date. EG Funds currently manages over $3 billion in Australia and the USA. Shane is also founder and partner of Ridley & Co, leader in building information modelling, BIM, and with over 270 employees. To mention just a few of Shane's vast array of achievements, founded 28 companies and businesses, published and sold over 100,000 educational books worldwide, given over 4,800 speeches, awarded the 2016 Entrepreneur of the Year Award for the Sydney Division by the Australian Institute of Engineers, declared the Engineering Public Speaking Champion five times by the Australian Institute of Engineers, awarded the Distinguished Toastmaster Award, contributing writer the Australian Financial Review, Your Investment Property and Sourceable, guest lecturer at the School of Architecture and Engineering at both Notre Dame University and Abla University of Balamund in Lebanon, guest lecturer at Shanghai Jai Tong University. So we have a very distinguished guest speaker, ladies and gentlemen. Um, so without further ado, please introduce and a round of applause to Dr. Shane Giha. Thank you. Thank you. What am I? On the basis of all wealth, the heritage of the wise, the thrifty, and the prudent. I'm the poor man's joy and comfort, the rich man's prize, the right hand of capital, the silent partner of many thousands of successful men. I'm the solace of the widow, the comfort of old age, the cornerstone of security against misfortune and want. I am handed down from ch to children through generations as a thing of greatest worth. I'm the choicest fruit of toil. Credit respects me, yet I am humble. I stand before every man bidding him know me for what I am. Though I seem dormant, my worth increases, never failing, never ceasing. Time is my aid and population heaps up my gain. Fire and the elements I defy, for they cannot destroy me. My possessors learn to believe in me. Invariably, they become envied. The thriftless speak ill of me. The charlatans of finance attack me. Yet I am trustworthy. I am sound. Minerals come from me. I'm the producer of food. The basis for ships and factories. The foundation of banks. Yet I'm so common that thousands pass by me every day. What am I? I am land. And this is the topic of today. <laughs> and I know every one of you today, like me, is invariably connected to the land equation. Somewhere, somehow, in some inextricable way, we all love this commodity called land. And this land, that we are talking about sits in perhaps 
I would say arguably, but perhaps indisputably, the world's most beautiful city. Now, I've been to 300 cities around the world, and I don't know about you, but I think we must say that if we're not the top, we're just about the top. It is very hard to beat Sydney anywhere you go. And what is it about Sydney that we so greatly love? When I was a kid, my father, a thief, he would take me down to the city. The city would be closed at 12 o'clock. And he'd say, son, look at this place. Can't even get a cup of coffee. This is not an international city. This, is not an inter this place will never make it. 30 years on, the best coffee in the world is in Sydney. Right? We haven't got the opening hours exactly right, but, right? Uh, we, something to work on. But at the end, we are the economic powerhouse of this nation. Sydney has just passed the five million person mark late last year. So just on 5.1 million people, congratulations. You finally made it on the world stage, folks. We have 1.7 million homes. And interestingly enough, and never forget it, and you should remind everybody in Victoria of this, we still produce 40% of the entire nation's GDP. Now, this is an interesting statistic, but in New South Wales in 2011, as recently as that, 59% of all people lived in the capital city in Sydney. But today, but by 2031, that number will go up to 63.5%. It's quite astounding. What it tells you is how prominent and how important the population patterns around Australia, around New South Wales will be for a place like Sydney. We will have two and a half million homes, uh, uh, sorry, two and a half million people per household and four million dwellings. But planning is hard. I mean, to those of you who know, and to many of you who have dabbled in it or have skirted at the edges of it or who have tried to get things through the system, you know that pr planning anything is hard. There's a nice picture. Does anyone know where that picture's from? Well, if you read a little bit of the text, it'll tell you that's the Champs-Élysées in Paris. Hands up anyone who's been to the Champs-Élysées in Paris. Yes. Did you like it? Yes. It's a beautiful boulevard. Now, the Champs-Élysées didn't exist until the late 1800s, right? And the Champs-Élysées did not exist because there was a squalor of poor people's houses that lived near the industrial center of Paris. The Champs-Élysées only occurred because the then Emperor of France, Napoleon III, decided that he wanted to reorder Paris. So he brought what was, who was then, the greatest architect of the European era, perhaps the greatest architect of all time, <laughs> Baron von Haussmann. And he said, Baron, I want you to fix Paris. And I'll tell you what else I'd like. I'd like a big boulevard, because I want to march down there with my victorious carriages and look like an emperor. And Hausman said, but your majesty, we've got a problem. There's a lot of houses to be moved. There's a lot of reordering to be done. To which, of course, Napoleon's answer was, bring in the general in charge of the French army. And he said to him, Whatever Baron Haussmann wants, just go and do it. And ladies and gentlemen, we only have the Champs-Élysées because of the autocratic and what seemed to be the invariably awful power of one powerful monarch. The point that I'm making is that reordering takes time. Democracy, as much as we love it, the greatest system in the world, undoubtedly, is not particularly good for either planning or reordering you actually end up with an animal that's got the stripes of a tiger, the head of a monkey, the tail of a lion, the shell of a tortoise. That's, that's kind of what democratizing the planning process sort of does. More or less, everybody's happy. But it's our system, and I never complain about our system. What did Marika say? Me not complain. Right, so I don't complain about our system because there are rules and we make the rules. 
But just to tell you that in 17 years, Hausman built 80 kilometers of new streets, he tore down hundreds of old buildings, and he dispersed 350,000 people. That's major city making. Now, let me liken this to some modern era. Here is 10 years, not 17. Between 2010 and 2020, to those of you who live in a city called Sydney, we've got a bit of a renewal going on, yes? We've got a new plan. We've got two new rail lines costing $16 billion. On a, on a per station basis, these happen to be the single most expensive stations of railway in the entire history of the Western universe. The West Connects is costing us $20 billion. The light rail, $3 billion. Plus, plus, we've got a new airport for $30 billion. These are great things. This is the genuine nation building exercise that you need to create cities with. Without massive investment in infrastructure, you can't actually do it. But let me say this, we've got some disadvantages. We've got no housemen, do we? I don't think so. We've got no overarching plan. We've got a city plan, we've got a three city plan. We don't have a huge plan to reorder the city. And of course, we don't have the powers that come with His Majesty, Mr. Napoleon III, which makes it a little bit harder still. But still, we're very good. Well, not excellent, but very good. These are the goals of the current planning system, to create a competitive city, to build better choice of housing, to put greater place with strong places, with healthy and well-connected communities, and to have a sustainable, resilient city. So, is our planning system doing it? My answer is at the bottom. Yes and no. Is that a good answer? Yes and no? I like this answer because I can never be incorrect. What, what is our planning and why do we have a problem with it? Let me explain very quickly. We've got one of the most curious planning systems in the world. We've actually got British planning superimposed upon it is the Euclidean segregational zoning of the US. So our planning system was, our current planning system is the 1979 EMP&A Act, which is a direct replica of the 1932 Town and Country Planning Act of Mother England. And our zoning actually was born in the US in a famous court case called Euclid and Ambler. And this is a very interesting court case because it was the court case that established that zoning was constitutional. The city of Euclid was a small town that was residential and it was being threatened by a burgeoning industrial city in Ohio, in Cleveland. And Cleveland was going to one day encompass the town, so the town went on and zoned itself into different segregated zones. It's sort of like when you have children, yeah? You, you'll all relate to this. When they're fighting, the best way to solve it is to say to one child, you go to your room, you go to your room, okay? That's called artificial peace, but it works. And that's what we've done with the zoning system. We've said, right, industrial, you don't want resi next to you. Resi, you don't want industrial next to you. So industrial, you go over there, Resi, you go over there and we'll put in the middle some other stuff. We'll call it commercial, we'll call it entertainment, we'll put some empty space. That's a great model for when you have 200,000 people and 7.7 .7 million square kilometers of land as we did in the 1800s. It's not a model that works particularly well in the very important world of today. And the reason is that if you separate all the land uses as we have so far prescribed, right? The only thing that happens is everything needs a car journey, right? You want a pint of milk? You've got to take the car. You've got to drop the kids off at childcare? You need the car. You want to go to work? You need the car, right? And unless you're close to public transport, that becomes an unsolvable problem, and you only need to look at somewhere like LA to know how poor it is to need a car journey for everything you need. So we have, up until recently, we had 43 councils, we had 150, 32 in New South Wales, um, and here we are. Look at that picture. I mean, 
People travel 20 hours in an aeroplane to see this harbour. And I've got that view out of my window every day. And really, sadly, I don't see it anymore. But, reflectingly, it is the world's most beautiful city. And it is probably, probably, undoubtedly, the world's most beautiful harbour. Now, let me just give you the essence of planning, because I will just move on from there. But the essence of planning was born in that court case in 1926, when Justice Sutherland ruled that zoning was in the public interest and therefore was constitutional. And within six months, 500 US cities had zoning ordinances, and we imported that same zoning model here to Australia. But the very principle that explains all zoning today is this. It goes, sic utiri tuo ut alienum non laetus. And that's Latin for, and do with yours so as to not injure another. So if you think of everything you go through in the planning system, it's all about the neighbours, it's all about impacts, and it's all about deleterious impacts. We rarely talk about the positive, it's always about mitigating the negative. That's how the planning system's structured, and that's why I think it's a bit too adversarial. It kind of looks a little bit like this. So if you, if you remember your colours from the zoning maps, there's something that's dark red and light red and, and blue and green and yellow and yellow is special use usually, and light, light red is, or purple. My children say I can't see colours very well, but I think that's, what, what do you call that, pink? Light red? Yeah, see, I got that right. So, and then the dark red is, is R4, which is high density, and then you've got the green open space, which is RE1. But you see, the separation of uses is a great concept when you have very few people and lots of space. And remember, we're a country of 7.7 .7 million square kilometres of land, and we're only occupied by a miserable little 26 million people. So, sorry, they're very nice, 26 million people, but there's not enough of them in this land. Now, let me give you some statistics that I think will interest you. Listen to this. this the segregational zoning model, of course, causes sprawl, but here's the metro area of Sydney. It covers 12,000 square kilometres, and the density is a lowly 404 people per square kilometre. Who's impressed with 404? Is anyone impressed with 404? Not very impressive. By the way, by the way, you might say, well, well, we don't like density. It brings traffic. It makes us feel like this. It make Let me explain something. If you are not comfortable with the notion of higher density, your public transport will never work. And if the public transport will never work, you better get used to longer and longer traffic queues till they become jammed up like LA one day. That's what will happen to us. So the model has to work on increased density, better patronage of public transport, and building up the city beyond the 404. Now how do we compare to the rest of the world? Because you think this is dense, right? People tell me Sydney's dense. Well, let's have a look. This is the area it covers. This is the 12,000 square kilometers. Good Lord, look at this. Now that's one of our projects. It's a nice one. How should cities grow? You can either go outwards or upwards. And I think we're going to have to go outwards anyway, but let's at least consider how we can best go upwards while we're doing that. Let me give you some comparisons. Paris. Probably people's fa whose favourite city in the world is Paris? Put your hand up. Yes. Right. 1,200 people per square kilometre, three times more dense than Sydney. Three times the density of Sydney. London. 1,500 people per square kilometer. And remember, London is a, that's my favorite city, London. It, and, it, and it is a, a city of low rise. It's a city of low rise. Rome, 2,200 people per square kilometer. I've put one in there that you'll all enjoy, Beirut. 3,300 people for this pre-biblical city per square kilometer. Tokyo, we're starting to get denser, 6,000. Singapore, nearly 8,000, and Manhattan and those parts of New York, around 11,000. Who thinks Sydney's dense at 400? Really, if you listen to the d disc jockeys in the morning, you know they are wrong. And you know at the end, if we don't know how to solve this now by densifying our city with existing infrastructure and public transport and pipes and water and electricity, eventually this will be unfixable. 
you'll have a sprawling metropolis that cannot be satisfied by retrofitting the public transport to it. And we're to a degree doing that, but this is what happens if you sprawl too much. I've, I've taken the liberty of taking an extract from one of my favorite books. It's a book, uh, planning books. Yeah, and that, let me clarify that. Uh, and the planning book basically is a book by a guy called Charles Landry. And let me read you a little bit of this because it's a bit of fun. Imagine yourself on a journey from out of town in summertime to a big city. It could be in Europe, the US, Australia, China, anywhere city bound. The signs of a city become apparent from about 30 kilometers from the once agricultural land to the now windowless, uniform, aluminium, industrial sheds, which on occasion are brightly colored. Yes, you're getting this picture? Closer to the city, these sheds become more compact. They have a more cluttered feel. The highway you are on has a more urban feel. Asphalt extends endlessly into the horizon. The highway is battered by numerous cars, all en route to the city. The asphalt is unresponsive and dead in look and in feel. Instructional signs begin to escalate. Instructional signs, instructional signs begin to escalate, telling you to slow down here, speed up there, where to veer off, into the suburbs before you reach the outer ring road. And in the distance, still 15 kilometers away, shimmering against the morning sun that breaks through the clouds, a high-rise building reflects a sharp shaft of sunlight. You get closer, structures pile up, it's getting denser, the sensation of asphalt, concrete, glass, bricks, noise and smell, mounts and spirals. Adverts swell, passing with greater frequency. Do this, do that, want me, desire me. With continued, your radio's on with continued interruptions. That makes 52 exhortations since you left home in the morning. Either way, you're now driving in a tunnel and you're beginning to smell the approaching city. The petrol vapor is warm, foul smelling, perhaps even comforting. It causes a light headed nausea, its urban smell par excellence. The hard surfaces of the city intensify. You're now in a completely built up area, but the multi lane highway means you can zip along. The lane has just widened to four lanes at this point, and you're now in a secure funnel guarding you straight into town. Uh, this evocative setting, I think, was very useful for me to always remember what would be the worst aspects of a sprawling city. And I think in Australia, we have now finally come to the conclusion that endless sprawl is a terrible thing, but we haven't quite grappled with the notion that density is a solution to any, many, many of our city problems. Now, the other really good panacea that you can apply is mixed use. Now, if the uses are not so segregated, and let's face it, a lot of the uses now that we used to once call industrial are innocuous, yes? They don't hurt anybody. I mean, I, I did a rezoning one time for Tip Tops and people complained that the smell of bread was a noxious smell. This was news to me. By the way, the entire culture now of the planning system is about complaining. Yeah? I'm going to share with you an example in a little while where a friend of mine rang me. See, we never do this. I never complain because, of course, I would be the ultimate hypocrite if we did. But I did a little exercise uh, in complaining, uh, which I'll share with you, which is a bit of fun. Now, rezoning is obviously a really good way of fixing up the old and transforming it into the new. And why do we need rezoning in a city? Why shouldn't things stay the same? Well, essentially because cities are like organisms. They're like a living being. They get older. They have different needs. Different parts of the city decay. Different parts of the city flourish. Different industries come and go. Different people want to live differently. Woolloomooloo 30 years ago when I was a child was a slum, was a, an industrial abandoned wasteland. Today it's amongst the most expensive real estate in Sydney. So rezoning is actually the fixing of the city. And I just want to share with you one very interesting example of a rezoning EG did at Little Bay some years ago. 
This was a 17 hectare site, so this is 170,000 metres. What was interesting about this is that it actually embodied every single problem you could ever encounter in the zoning and the planning system. The first thing we had was we had old systems title, and the client came to us and said, well, what does that mean? So I'll tell you what that means. That means you don't talk to anyone, you just give the paperwork to me, and you leave it with me so we can secure a title. Because anybody who challenges old system, if they are able to prove their connectivity with the land, are able to take the land off you. So that was the first problem. Uh, the other really interesting thing is we began a process of rezoning the land from its original special use to its later uh, mixed use master plan. And what we discovered is that the Australian legal statutory system has an interesting quirk. And that is that our client, which was a university, owned land in its private capacity as a citizen, but it lodged DAs in its capacity as the Crown. Now this is a very interesting point to me because when you're the crown, something very interesting happens. That you're a bit like Napoleon III, yes? Are you impressed with the Napoleon III? Oh, okay. You see, a crown's DA can never be refused. And a crown's DA can never be conditioned without the express written consent of the crown. So there I was, I did all these studies, I did 3,027 pages per submission. They wanted 17 copies of the Randwick Council. We needed, I couldn't get it in my car. We need to get a truck to take it, a van. We loaded the van with paperwork. We took it all to the council. And the director of planning, who's still a friend of mine, would you believe, uh, rang me up, yes, uh, rang me up and he said, well, we're gonna take a long time to consider this. I said, I don't think you will. He said, but this is such a big submission. I said, but it is the Crown that is submitting this document. And he said, so what does that mean? I said, it means you might as well approve it now because you're gonna have to approve it in one week or two weeks or three weeks and you can't even condition it. Anyway, he said, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna check with the legal team. So he rings me back and he says, Shane. I said, yes. He said, apparently, we can't refuse this DA. I said, apparently, you can't. He said, Shane. Amazingly, apparently, we can't even condition this DA. I said, apparently, you can't. The only way you can condition or refuse a DA of the Crown is with the express written condition of the Crown. So I like this. The only way they can refuse my DA is if I tell them that they can refuse it in writing from me. It really worked. For once, for once, it's happened twice, but that was the first time the shoe was on the other foot. I now was the consent authority. <laughs> now, everything on this land was an issue. Flora and Flora. We, we had uh, the eastern suburbs Banksia scrub. Has anyone come across this thing? Are you an Imak Machufa? The eastern suburbs Banksia scrub. Now I know why it's become endangered. Because everyone who saw it in the backyard pulled it out, right? At any rate, we protected 1.1 hectares of it. The cost of that, in terms of land, was $25 million protected. I'm a great believer in protection. But the greatest funny story here, we had geological formations, we had ochre deposits that were allegedly Aboriginal. Uh, we had water bodies that had been dug up because the university mined sand in 1973 and the holes filled up with water when God made it rain, yeah? And then they became natural water bodies. I, I said, how are these natural? They said, well, they're natural now. I said, but until 1971, they weren't here. Yes, but they're natural now. And guess what? The green and golden Belfron, he could come here. I said, but we've tested it extensively and he's not here. Neither are any of his girlfriends. <laughs> they said, but he could come here. Anyway, we negated that one successfully, but here was the thing. The migrating egret. Has anyone heard of her? No, she, she's special, right? Now, she comes once a year from sub-Antarctic regions. You've heard of this? Sub-Antarctic regions. She flies for a week and a half to come to New South Wales to lay her eggs in the warmer climate. I said, we've never spotted her. We've done the bird sounds. We've done the full report. $100,000 later of ecological studies, nothing. Ah, oh, but this is a very big problem. You've got to wait till next year in case she comes later in the year. I said, let me understand this. Because, you know, I only have three degrees from university. 
Let me get this. She comes from Sub-Antarctica. She's flying for a week and a half. She flies over the ocean, over Bass Strait. She gets to Wilson's Promontory in Victoria. She sees piles of empty land. She says, I don't want it. She goes past all of northern Victoria. She doesn't want it. She goes all of southern New South Wales, which is vast, empty land right on the coast, beautiful lagoons, beautiful beaches. She says, not here. Then she comes to Little Bay. She says, this is it. <laughs> is that what you're telling me? He said, Shane, you're being unreasonable. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, you know now what is wrong with the planning system. Um, we are, I think like Bob Hope once said, he said, I'm dying with the help of too many physicians. The doctors are doing the killing, right? But at the end, it is our system, I may not complain, uh, it is our system and they're our rules. And if we don't like the rules, then we should work on changing our own rules. So this is no one's fault. And you know they say there's no greater joy in the world than quoting oneself at a public occasion. So why don't I do that? <laughs> when most people object to what developers have delivered, they're not actually objecting about density or FSR. They're objecting about the architecture. People don't understand FSR. FSR is the gross floor area divided by the land. It's a number. And some people are fixated with that number, but in reality, what we don't like about our cities, and there was an article in the paper four weeks ago, and I, I'm a contributor to the press, what, what astounds me is what most people hate is actually fully compliant with the rules. Now, if you make enough rules, trust me, I deal with them every day, and I've changed three quarters of them. Three, almost every LEP in Sydney would have had something changed by us over the last 20 years, right? And they still don't make sense, because at the end, the rules are here to serve the people. Yeah? The rules are here to serve the people and to make our city better. I've given you a little example. Here's Central Park. This building's won an international award as the best building in the world. FSR, eight to one. Here's a little building in Burwood. Please don't get me wrong, I love Burwood. We built two buildings there. But that's a three to one FSR. Most people would look at that and say, ugly, don't like it, please don't do it again. And most people would look at the first one and say, love it, please do tens of these. So at the end, at the end, it's actually how we do things and how we make them present that matters. And sometimes I find the difference between a great project and an awful project is actually just a bit of thought up front. People talk about the cost, it's not true. We all build for roughly the same cost. I mean, we're Lebanese, we probably build a bit cheaper, <laughs> but, but not much cheaper, like not 50% cheaper, then otherwise no one would build with anyone else, right? So, today's planning. Let me tell you this. A friend of mine rang me not long ago, and he said, I, am, I live in a beautiful home in a part of Sydney. I, I won't reveal too much in case you ring him, but <laughs> don't ring him. But, and he said, I would like you to send me an objection because the bloke next door is building a wall that's two meters tall. Now, I want to explain the context of this. I've never objected to anything in my life because that would be hypocritical. But he's a friend of mine. I'm going to help him. He's a lawyer, by the way, a barrister, so he can write his own letters, but he wanted some kind of planning speak. So let me tell you this. I've never seen the wall. I don't know the project. I don't know the people next door. I don't know the impact. But let me write for you eight objections off the top of my head without knowing anything. Listen to this. You'll love this. The proposal demonstrates excessive bulk and scale, which is not in keeping with the established streetscape. There you go. Proposal lacks in its current form any architectural treatment to demonstrate aesthetic values. Absolutely. The proposal does not produce an appearance that complements other structures in and around the area and is therefore too obtrusive in appearance and character. Can anyone argue with this? By the way, I don't know what it is that I'm talking about <laughs> yet. I know it's a wall. Hmm. The structure is intended to be constructed of material that lack any aesthetic or architectural merit. Well, it appears to be. Hmm? No one can argue with that. And here's the next page. The proposal is not in the public interest. You can always say this. It's always true. <laughs> always true. It's like saying, love Jesus, right? It's always true. The suggested structure poses serious privacy considerations. If you put the word serious in front of any noun, it sounds very impressive. This is a serious matter. See, you've got your attention already. 
The suggested structure poses serious privacy considerations on our property and those of others. Oh, those of others, that's in the public interest. The proposal in its current form has significant and deleterious. I always like to chuck in a few tetrasyllabic words because it makes you sound really sophisticated, right? Overshadowing impact and should be reduced in both scale and bulk. See, if you take bulk and scale and reverse it, it sounds like a new sentence. It's a great trick, right? The proposed structure is in clear contravention of the setback requirements as set out in the Waverley DCP 2012 and must be made to comply to minimize its impact on existing dwellings. By the way, I have no idea what's in the, in the DCP because I've not seen the structure, um, but I just think that holds because for them to find out that they're in, not in contravention, that's another three weeks. <laughs> that's the problem with the planning system. Anyone can object, it doesn't have to be real. Now, when Justice Sutherland, who invented zoning in 1926, was asked, because their system became like ours, clogged up with hundreds of rules, LEPs, DCPs, REPs, uh, VPAs, this and that, blah, 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 wake up in the morning rules, sleep at night rules, go around the block rules, rules everywhere, yeah? All with the help of so many physicians, yeah? This is, this is good for you, you must have the rules. And they said to him, Justice Sutherland, Chief Justice he was, what do we do? How do we know which one of these rules do we follow? And he said, whenever I'm confused about the rules, I always follow one rule. And this is called the supreme rule, in my opinion. And it goes like this. It's Latin, which will sound impressive. Uh, Salus populi suprema lex est. The welfare of the people is the supreme law. So if you're confused about which law, if you're not sure which one to apply, which DCP, which LEP, number nine, number three, condition 17, 117 direction, remember one rule. Salus populi suprema lex est. The welfare of the people, of these people, of our people, of this state, of our city. That's the supreme law. And now, I remind you of one important thing, and that is that Sydney is not the buildings. Sydney is not the streets. Sydney is not the parks. Sydney is us. We are Sydney. And Sydney is naturally beautiful, and it's very low density by world standards. If we want it to be the most amazing city going forward, we should think about how to build it up and build it beautifully and always care for the outcome that we leave behind because the stuff we do lives for 80 years after us. So for a little bit extra, if you can make the ugly look beautiful, we should always think about doing it. And Sydney is destined to go on a great journey. And I'd like to end with the, wor with the words of one of my favorite engineers of all time, <laughs> the guy that invented pre-stressed concrete, a guy called Francois Fresenet. And he said, far and away, the best prize life has to offer is the chance to work hard at something worth doing. Mr. MC. Thank you, Shane. Um, what I'd like to do, we were going to conduct an interview with Shane, but I think that just to the purpose of time, what we'll do, we'll open it up to the floor to ask uh, Dr. Gihar some questions. I think that may be relative to planning or in life in general. I will uh, say one note. Um, Shane, you've run 17 city to serves and three half marathons. So it seems like you keep on running all the time. So uh, there must be some merit to it. <laughs> Just turn this on. Yeah. Um, I, I discovered at the age of 15 that I wasn't good at short distance. Uh, and as soon as I started running the 3,000 and the 5,000, it, it seemed to be my thing. And I don't know, I, I seem to have enjoyed the, the solitude of running. It's, it's an activity where you, I loved cricket, but to organize a cricket match, Peter, you need 22 people, you need a pile of gear. By the time you get them all together, the game doesn't happen. Whereas with running, you just put the Nikes on and off you go. But well, is it, uh, you have to have a look at it, that uh, planning is a long-term... That's right. Haul, so so it's very and you've got time synonymous. to think about the planning problems on a 10K run. <laughs> Good. Yeah. I'll open up some questions to the floor. Does anyone have any questions? We've got some roaming mics that uh, could probably move around. Can I get any hands up? 
I'll ask one question to start off before uh, some others ask. I think one of the other questions in relation to transport and the way that the Sydney Commission has come out with its report for 2054 or 56, something like that. Um, does density answer Sydney's real problem with transport and will the current situation of transport get any worse before it gets better? In my view, density solves a lot of transport's problems. See, when people complain that there are too many cars on Windsor Road or, or Anzac Parade, what they don't understand is those cars should have an option. Those people in those cars, Peter, should have an option, and they currently don't. So the more public transport you create for people to efficiently move between one place and, an, and another, every one of those good decisions will take people off the road. Now, the roads are limited. They can't be expanded very much more in terms of lanes, and the population's increasing. So if we don't manage the planning and the transport together, Right? But I think it's insane, for instance, that we're building an $8 billion train line in the northwest sector where for one kilometre around each of those stations, there isn't massive amounts of density. We've still got houses, we're still playing with the FSRs, working out whether we come or go. Uh, in reality, this is a golden opportunity. We have the infrastructure built at great public expenditure cost. I think um, one of the other factors that I can uh, ask is... Um in terms of planning and the way that you see planning, governments are starting to become very obtrusive and uh, are impacting cost. So costs are, are a large part driven by taxes and government intervention. Um, what do you say about housing affordability and, and what's actually happening? Because housing affordability is a function of government impost. Uh, definitely. I, uh, I've written a lot about this in the press and if any of you are on my LinkedIn pro, uh, link, you will see that I've written on this very matter. In fact, out of uh, an average apartment cost of, say, $800,000 today, almost a third of that, $240,000 is fees and charges. I had uh, one of the greatest uh, professors in the world on housing affordability, a guy called Professor Richard Pizer from the Harvard Business School, uh, visit us earlier this year, and I hosted a forum on affordability with him. He was President Reagan's housing advisor. And, and he advised New York City on its affordability programs. And he was saying, it's impossible for us to have a third of the cost of an apartment as taxes. And then when I showed him the statistics, you've got GST, you've got the stamp duty on 5.5%, uh, you've got land tax of 1.6% every year, then you've got all the VPA charges, you've got the DA, you've got the Section 94s, y you can keep adding them on. And now you've got the affordable housing levy, yeah? Um, he was astounded. He said, you can never deliver product for an affordable price. I think we're probably stuck if the government isn't prepared to put up land for free somewhere under prescribed conditions to, say, have key workers accommodated somewhere in the city. Because I think it's a wrong city model to have all the rich living in the city and the poor live somewhere on the outskirts, because the poor actually are uh, for a lot of the time. And by the way, most of us started as poor once, or our parents, so we should always remember that. Um, so the policemen, the nurses, the firemen, the ambulance workers are not on high wages. It's inconceivable that they would travel 50 kilometres to come and service the police station next to your house. Therefore, we must have a model where we have a more heterogeneous city, where the city is mixed with a variety of different people of different incomes. Your gardener should not come from the Blue Mountains to come and tender your garden. He shouldn't, or she shouldn't. Uh, so, in, in reality, uh, that's a bad city model. I think, I think Sydney will be London if we're not careful, if it's not already. Peter, okay. question this way. Table 25. Uh, thank you. Um, I've had the pleasure of both running and watching cricket with Shane. Um, <laughs> I do have a, a relevant Hi, business perfect. question today, though. Uh, what, what would be your view on dealing with the, the affordable housing issue that you've, you've touched upon as far as the... Uh, um, more affordable housing options in and around the, uh, the centre of Sydney to provide that balance between the, the rich and the poor. Thanks, Chris. I, I have a simple... I like to think of things simply, right? In an $800,000 apartment, say, a third of the cost is fees and charges, a third of the cost, roughly, say, 4000 bucks a metre of that, or four hundred grand, is construction cost, and the rest is land costs. 
So you've got to look at the three components. You've got to think, which one of these can I shrink to create affordability? Now, construction costs is probably the hardest to play with because it's composed of materials and labor. So that's probably not going to go very far if we're thinking of it in the Western context. So that's probably untouchable, that 400,000. The next bit is the land cost, which ought to be the most elastic because it ought to be a total component of supply and demand. But today, from the time you and I conceive that we want to put houses in a, in a location to the time we actually have people inside the house is five years. Think about it. By the time we bought the land, settled the land, done the DA, done the CC, and then built it, that's five years. Five years. So that's got to be the most inelastic supply-demand equation in the world. And therefore, therefore, the land will not change enormously in price under those circumstances. And we have a planning system that every day makes new rules. By the way, they ring me and ask me about these sometimes. And I tell them, great idea, but take another rule out. It's actually the Donald Trump rule. I never thought I'd say this. But actually, you need to take stuff out if you're going to put stuff in. Uh, but the problem is we just now, we now have, I don't know, 136 items that I deal with in terms of the legislative requirement for a building. So actually, the only way it can work is if the government puts up the land for free or a reduced cost under prescribed conditions, right? And then some of the fees and charges federally and state and local are, or all are removed. And then we can deliver it at a profit. And then you can have an apartment for 450000 right? And it can only be given to a fireman, a policeman, and it can be given to a special housing provider under prescribed conditions, and that would work every time. And if you're worried about affordability, that's a very nice way of having people of those very important, critical key workers living in your suburbs. That's my opinion. Well done. Uh, Dr. Kahab, there's a question I'd like to ask you about the hybrid of the U American and the British systems. Do they work well together? And how do they work in the other two places? And the second question, if you can remember it kindly, is why are we spending so much, as you rightfully point out, on infrastructure that's not required when we need our money in other places now? Why isn't there a system that prevents this, no matter who is in government? Yes. Uh, on, your, on the first half of your question, um, it doesn't exist anywhere as a hybrid in the world other than here. The British have no zoning. Uh, by the way, one of the nicest theories of Britain uh, comes from the times of Charles I in the 1600s, uh, and it's called the Doctrine of Ancient Lights. Has anyone heard of this? The Doctrine of Ancient Lights was that if you had an ancient light coming through your window, you were entitled to that light. And that was the world's first DCP in 1640, so in a sense. But, but in reality, every time you layer a building with rules, I look at the Hornsby DCP. Honestly, I don't even need an architect. It draws the building for me. Everything's prescribed. It even tells me how much before I need a recess in the wall. Um, so, and, and in terms of infrastructure, I'm all for it, even though I think it's ridiculously expensive. I think spend the money. Put it in the ground, it will never leave. We waste it on so many other things. Let's spend it on trains, let's spend it on trams, let's spend it on better public transport for our citizens. And I always say, salus populi suprema lex est. The welfare of the people is the supreme law. Any further questions? Well, I'll, what I'll do is I'll, uh, I'll wrap it up. I might just uh, introduce uh, uh, Michael Simons to come up and give a vote of thanks. And I'll also introduce Joe Qatar to come up uh, so we can, uh, and Shane to come up so we can uh, give you a small gift for, and thanks for today. Anyone uh, would like to put their business cards in? I'll just grab this around while Michael talks, sir. Thank you, Peter. <coughs> On behalf of the ALCC board members and sponsors, we would like to thank Dr. Shane Giha for his lively and insightful <coughs> presentation. Thank you for sharing your passion and ideas with our guests today. Development is crucial to the growth of our great city. We hope you all leave today with a little more inspired, with a little more inspired. Shane, the ALCC thanks you 
and the AG Group for your ongoing support. Shane, that's a, that's a small gift to tell you thank you for these positive uh, comments in relation to the, to the progress of Sydney in a positive way, and thank you again. Thank you, Mr. It's got beautiful Lara picking. Um, Sylvia Mazali, Masala, from Fuse. Down the end there. Sylvia, you just want to make your way up here. It's coming. Ladies and gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, yep. uh, ladies and gentlemen, t that concludes the formalities for the event, but please uh, stay and enjoy and uh, network and uh, we'll see you at the next event at the business lunch sometime in July. Thank you.